This story began over 30 years ago in Germany. I had just turned 16 and was accused of stealing a neighbor's car and wrecking another neighbor's fence with it while running away from the police. I was drunk when the police picked me up, legal in Germany. I proclaimed my innocence, but nobody believed me. I was convicted and sentenced to 500 hours of community service because I was unrepentant. My parents used it as a tool to take away my time with my friends. They got the judge to agree that I had to work Friday and Saturday evenings at the THW, an organization that will provide disaster relief and sometimes soup kitchens. Also, I lost my license for mopeds and could not get a driver's license till 20. In addition, when I finally wanted to get my license, I would have to pass a psychological test. Also, the money I had saved for a car, around 10,000 DM, was used to pay for the damages. Sadly, it worked. My friends soon lost interest in me because I was not able to party during the weekend. Also, we were very vehicle-oriented and I was destined to be a pedestrian for four years. An uncle of mine led the local THW and conveniently lost my timesheets for work done at the THW, which forced me to work there for 14 months. In total, I did a bit more than 900 hours. The time there did teach me quite a lot and it was interesting work which I would probably have liked if I was not forced to do it. My parents told me they were doing it for my own good, to save me from my friends and that they had asked my uncle to keep me there longer so that I would be forced to learn to take responsibility for my actions. That time ended as all things do. I left unrepentant and furious with them for essentially doubling my sentence. I was in great shape, did good in school, as I lost my friends and had no interest in acquiring new ones after seeing how fickle they were. Focusing on academics was an outlet that was not forced on me by others, and I enjoyed it. Then I found out who had actually crashed the car. I told the police, my parents, and tried to get my sentence repealed. I tried a Vyderofname Werfahren and failed because my sentence was already served. The guy who actually did the deed was sentenced to only 100 hours of community service. At his trial, it came out that several people had known it was him, including my parents, who made him pay for the damages almost a year ago. They had put the money in the bank account, which they told me I would get once I finished my education, school and university or apprenticeship. They also added 15,000 DM to the savings account for the hours I had put in with the THW, which was a generous wage for a teenager. Still, I was furious with them because I would still have to wait till 20 to get a driver's license. If they would have told me sooner, I could have gotten the sentence repealed. Also, they might give me 25000 in about five years, but for now they had essentially stolen my savings, and they were not giving it back while they thought I was too immature to make my own choices. After a huge fight, I took my tent and camped out in the woods, still going to school but not coming back home. After a week, they called the cops on me, which took the tent and forced me to go home. I was 17. Once the police left, so did I. I went to school every day. I slept wherever I could, mostly barns and in the woods if weather was good, as I now had no tent. On occasion, the police found me. My parents called them every day for help. If caught, I would be forced to go home. They locked me in a room, but I simply waited for school and disappeared after school was out. Finally, I turned 18. Now the police could not force me to go home. I only had half a year left to finish school, so I continued like this. I had no friends because I smelled funny, and no interest in getting any friends because I was hurt and was not going to let anybody close to hurt me again. Still, I managed to finish school with good grades. After school, I used the mandatory military service to disappear. I volunteered for service abroad, which meant Eastern Europe at the time. After two years, I was done and had a nice nest egg. During my time in the military, I had no close friends, but at least I was no longer a pariah. I enrolled in a university and studied chemistry. I found three good friends and met my first girlfriend to whom I am now married. I was 29 and working on my doctorate when my parents managed to find me. Occasionally, they convinced the police to look for me as a missing case. The police usually found me. I told them I was fine but wanted no contact with my parents and that was it. The police told them that I was fine and that they can't tell them where I was and that they should please stop involving the police. Then, my parents had a genius idea. They filed paperwork that I had died in an accident in Italy. They were my next of kin, so the police gave them my address. Meanwhile, my bank account was frozen. The university told me that I was no longer allowed to work on my doctorate while being dead, and lots of other things stopped working for me. 
two days into this disaster, and my parents are in front of my flat and demand to talk to me, telling me that I forced them to take this step. They force their way inside and tell me that they will stay until I am willing to talk to them and mend bridges. I told them if they insist, they can have the flat. Took my laptop, a few mementos, important documents, and a bag of clothes. I left the keys and walked out. It took me a few months to convince the bureaucracy that tales of my death were widely exaggerated. My landlord was very understanding and gave me everything that was left in my flat. After my parents understood that I would not be coming back, they mostly took the photos I had left in the flat. They left a letter which I burned. I was really pissed because being dead caused so many troubles. I was afraid that they would find me again, so I took a job in another city as soon as I had finished my doctorate. That was 15 years ago. They have found me again. This time they told a relative, who told me that they were sorry and that they did not want to explode when they found me and that they did not want to force me to abandon my flat back then, but their emotions got the better of them. They would respect it if I still wanted no contact, but they would love to have me and my wife for dinner. Honestly, I'm not sure what to do. What should I do? Some random info that didn't fit in. I never managed to get my driver's license. I failed the psychological evaluation because I was not willing to confront my drinking problem. I would have had to show remorse for a drunk driving incident I did not commit, so I gave up on that. I could probably get it now without the test, but I got used to not having a driver's license and no longer want one. Never got the money from the parents, but I don't need it. They probably still have it with interest in the account. They are self-righteous pricks, but they did all that in an attempt to bring me on the correct way. I am very certain that if I had contacted them and told them that I am done with university and have a job, please wire the money to that account, they would have done it. For me, no contact with them was more important at the time. I'd recommend legally changing your name. They clearly haven't changed and are still only thinking of themselves. Unless you desire a relationship with them, I would encourage you to maintain no contact. Dude, I cannot believe how badly your parents screwed you. I'm slightly shallow, so I'd probably get the money from them if they agree to go to a family counseling session. In the session, I'd tell them how badly they ruined my life and how although they gave birth to me, they messed up so badly by framing me and declaring me dead that I absolutely positively do not want to be in contact ever again. I forgive you, but I cannot forget the hell you put me through. You are terrible parents and do not deserve to have the love of your child. Goodbye. These people are malicious and did several things that are probably illegal and certainly immoral. I would stay as far away from them as possible. I don't believe they have changed since they have consistently over the years behaved in an atrocious manner. It also rubs me the wrong way that they are apologizing for one relatively minor offense while ignoring the more serious ones. Arranging a lie to the government to double your sentence. Stealing your money to have you under their thumb until they decide to give it back hiding information that would absolve you of a crime, lying to the government that you are dead. Each one of these is by itself enough of a reason to never associate with these people again. I highly doubt that they have changed, so be aware that when you don't agree to meet them, which you definitely shouldn't agree to, they may resort to their crazy ways and do something on par with reporting you dead. I, 29 male, am supposed to marry my fiancé, 25 female, this summer. Now, the problem comes from my sister, 27 female, who's mad about me having Mike, 29 male, as my best man. Mike's my best friend since middle school, and he's also one of my sister's exes from high school. They've dated when he was 17 and she was 15. It was a short-lived relationship, ended abruptly after my sister found out that he was two-timing her with someone else from his class. My sister was really heartbroken at the time, with Mike being her first love and all that and my relationship with Mike was also strained for the rest of high school, but he did eventually manage to patch things up between us. What he did to my sister way back in high school is definitely still ducked up, but he was just a stupid teenager back then, like all of us once were, and he definitely matured a lot since then, so I eventually got over it and forgave him. However, my sister didn't, as she still hung up on me being friends with him, and not only inviting to my wedding, but also making him my best man. She even threatened to not attend my wedding if I keep Mike as my best man, which I think is really unreasonable from her, as all she and Mike had was a very short high school relationship, and she also has a fiancé now, so she should have moved on by now, right? I really don't want to demote Mike from that position, as he's the best fit for it, but my sister's still standing her ground as well, and I really wouldn't want my own sister to purposefully miss my wedding. 
Am I the a-hole? No judgment, but your sister's issue to me is with you choosing a guy who cheated on her over her. Your relationship was strained because he was an a-hole to your sister. Good you knew he did something crappy, but you then chose to patch things up with him and have him be your best friend. Did he ever try and apologize to your sister for his crappy behavior? Honestly, to me, your sister's issue isn't even really about him, but about you seeming to not really care about her. And that is symbolized by having him as your best man, standing beside you on your wedding day. Since I was a baby, my father has never changed his philandering ways. I have grown up to seeing my mother and father's toxic relationship. Yet, my mother never kicked him out for all the 36 years of marriage with my father being unfaithful. I have been in countless therapy sessions as an adult due to depression caused by this. However, my mom has been keeping it strong and has only her friend and I to talk to for support. Last week, my father royally ducked up by accidentally going on Facebook Live with his new mistress in a see-through, very sheer clothing. This was viewed by my sister-in-law, my cousin and both parents' side, my mother's co-worker that they're friends with, and many other people in his friends list, including me, who lives overseas. I was so heartbroken, angry, sad, and to be honest, quite feeling vengeful for the past few days. I screenshot her image on his Facebook to send to him and confront him, as well as telling him that I am cutting ties with him, practically saying that he is now dead to me. My brother found out from my mother, whom I have been in close contact for emotional support, that I have cut ties with my father, and was furious because he thinks that family is family no matter what. I told him that our mother doesn't deserve us sticking with our father, what with all the pain he has caused her, and it's about time for someone to stand up for our mother. I love my brother, but I want to make him understand that what I did is for my own mental health as well as my mother's, as well as to at least reclaim some of the dignity caused by my father's shameful act. Your brother sees how your father behaved, yet after 36 years, He's still married to your mother. This is how your brother thinks successful relationships work, and he doesn't want you rocking the boat. Your parents have taught your brother that this is what a normal relationship looks like, and he's got a pretty ducked-up worldview at age 29, a fully grown adult. Honestly, your mother could have stood up for herself at any point. She is also a fully grown adult. There's this thing that my mother-in-law, who is in the mental health field, told me. What others think of me is none of my business. It might seem like an odd thing to say in this instance, but hear me out. You will never truly be able to change what others think of you, and it's not really your place to, because their thoughts are not your own, and yours are your own. Let your brother think what he will. Let him be the one on the outer. Stand firm. If you feel the need to say anything, just point out that you haven't done anything that your father hasn't already done on his own, and that pointing out that you were the one to finally say something doesn't make you the perpetrator. I'm the resident baker in my office. Typically, I will bake something for every team member's birthday. There are 11 of us, but some birthdays are close together, so I bake probably every month or two for the office between birthdays and treats that I just feel like baking. I bake everything from scratch, and I'm somewhat particular about my ingredients, so not to toot my own horn too much, but I'm a decent baker. I usually ask people what flavors they like and just kind of run with it and bake what I feel like making. I do this all out of my own salary, the company doesn't pay me to do it, and I'll be honest, I don't make a lot of money. But I really love baking, and there's truly no greater joy for me than seeing someone bite into one of my cupcakes and tell me how good it is. My new co-worker, Samantha, Sam, has a birthday coming up. Sam is gluten-free. I do not bake gluten-free for a few reasons. The main one is the cost. Gluten-free flours are much more expensive than AP flour, putting them out of my budget. But also, I use gluten in my kitchen, so I cannot guarantee no cross-contamination. Lastly, I'm just not familiar with baking gluten-free, and I don't have tried-and-true recipes that are gluten-free, the way I do for wheat flour. Sam asked me what I was baking for her birthday, and I was honest that I wasn't planning on baking anything specific for it. She asked me why, and I told her my reasons, and she threw a fit. She went off on me, telling me she knew I didn't like her, and I'm jealous of her because she's young and cute. I'm not young anymore, but I think I'm pretty damn cute. I tried to explain to her that it wasn't about her as a person, but she said I was making excuses to exclude her. Now she's telling everyone in the office I'm discriminating against her for her health needs. And two people have told me I'm being cruel to the new girl. Not the a-hole. Don't bake for anyone anymore. When everyone asks why, 
Oh, the last time I didn't because I couldn't guarantee no gluten cross-contamination. I was accused of discrimination. So, it's only fair no one gets a cake now. Besides, people are becoming entitled despite this coming out of my own time and money. And the cross-gluten contamination is a massive issue with gluten. Just to really highlight how unreasonable it was. OP would not only need expensive all-new ingredients, but would need all-new cookware. Gluten sticks to things like wood, cast iron, silicone, and certain plastics. If everyone else in the office cared that much, they could have started a pool to buy a cake for her from a gluten-free bakery. But oh look, they didn't, because it's too expensive for them to each chip in $5, but not too expensive for OP to buy new cookware and ingredients.